Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everyone. Jumma Mubarak, welcome, welcome. So, Bismillah, let us begin. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina man yadihillahu falamudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lahu wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all praise be to allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness we seek refuge with allah from the evil of our own souls and our bad deeds whomsoever allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever allah leaves astray no one can guide and i bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one, having no power. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhal nas uttaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidatan wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاعَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُسْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُتَعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْد O oh, ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. O oh, humanity, be mindful of your creator. Be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate. And through both Allah spread countless men and women. And be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. O oh, ye who believe, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great trial. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So recently through Muslim Space, we've been doing a variety of programs, particularly centered on personal and spiritual connection and relating to faith. And so we've had the functioning Muslim for youth ages 18 to 24. We've had the Prophet وسلم, and I summer Sira series that happens on Fridays. And then we have the spiritual connection groups and so many other things there. But uh, for me personally, I feel like I'm always on the hunt for recommendations as I facilitate these in, term, in a sense of uh, recommendations for things that might be relevant to those specific events or topics. So uh, if it's books, movies, anything that can help give me some more insight to the material. So especially for the CIRA series. So any, anything that can help make the event more engaging and help me get something more out of it uh, is, is always something that I'm on the hunt for. So I'm always searching for relevant books and my search happened to have found me going to a most unordinary text for the circumstance. So I don't know how many of y'all are fans of Harry Potter, but I, I stumbled upon this book, um, you know, for, for, a, a, for in a long time coming in a sense. And so given that our Sierra session last week was on finding your true purpose and being given a rude awakening by God to your true purpose. And our functioning Muslim program yesterday focused on career and vocations. It actually became quite a relevant text when thinking about what would we talk about for this khutbah? What would we talk about um, for, for this Friday? And so now I must admit that I am quite late to jump on to the Harry Potter bandwagon, despite uh, growing up with the books and you know growing up at the same time that they were coming out. Uh, and major props are due to my wife, who stayed persistent over these past three years and didn't leave me when I was being most stubborn with not wanting to read them. The movies uh, were the only exposure I had, but uh, I didn't have a pressing interest to read the books or uh, even just give into it, despite my wife's best efforts and 
continuous derisive comments from Harry Potter nerds who would chide me uh, that the movies are not sufficient. And so, however, as we started the Prophet Sallallahu and I series, and we talked about finding ways to connect our faith and connect to our faith, as well as the example of the Prophet Sallallahu not just who the Prophet Sallallahu was, but what he had experienced and who he was beyond the black and white dates and facts that we normally will just attribute to him and just leave it at that. Um, I couldn't help but take a break from those traditional biographies and readings and crack open Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and give it a read and see if there might be something of resonance here. There might be something of connection that I can find. And so as we, as I jumped in here, uh, and as I had prefaced, I believe in an earlier khutbah, that when looking at something, when looking at something and reading something, especially from a faith conscience lens, whatever you might read, whatever you might look in, but you take it in from a certain lens, uh, many stories and things in form of entertainment or parables or whatever they might be, they can really be connected to and give you more of an appreciation for your faith faith tradition, as well as uh, that which is sacred. It's just looking at it from a different perspective, but we want to be open to reading something and then seeing the connections there in a result to get a better uh, understanding. And so most people who've read Harry Potter probably relate more to one of the characters in the books uh, more than they probably do with their faith or people who are exemplars within the faith. And Islam is no exception. There's, there's, there's a, there's a uh, sense of relatedness or relatability uh, that is achieved with these characters that is achieved with the uh, things that are in uh, fiction uh, creation that that we find appealing, and sometimes they find they find more of a resonance with us than uh, that which is sacred in our tradition, that which is in our own faith. And so now this kutba, I, I want to clarify, is not intended to dive into the parallels between elements of Harry Potter and the Sirah, because not everyone might be familiar with Harry Potter or the Sirah fully. Not everyone is completely versed in that, and that might be a conversation for another day or time or for our uh, Sira class. And so there are many, though, that you might want to discuss. You might want to talk about how Harry Potter and the Prophet ﷺ were both orphaned at a young age and were had both witnessed to their mothers passing away at a young age. You might talk about how both of them had to deal with constricting, detracting, and difficult family members, especially an antagonistic uncle and aunt, not saying that Abu Lahab and Umm Jamil are like Vernon Dursley or Aunt Petunia, but you get the picture there that how both of them received their true calling and their role in this world unexpectedly and out of nowhere without any kind of desire to, to go into that area. Or how about that both in childhood had a formative influence and care from those who took them under their wings and created an intentional space for them outside of a distressing situation. So whether you think of Abdul Muttalib or Abu Talib or Albus Dumbledore. So, or even how both had to leave home in order to truly be able to actuate and grow into their roles alongside a community that not only they formed, but helped form them as well. So I could go on. I can go on with these parables, but are the parallels that are there. But again, it might be for another time and for those who might find the series of interest. For all I know, most of y'all might not even find the series of interest or have read it. So uh, th this might be going right over your head. But as I mentioned for now, I just wanna simply lift up a simple premise that can be found both in Harry Potter and in the Sirah, which is of the utmost relevant to us today uh, as Muslims, as people um, of faith in, in our world today. That is with regards to finding your true calling, whether it's vocationally speaking or spiritually speaking and how often it is done and how often and oftentimes it's done in such a way that it just catches us off guard, that we're unprepared, we're giving a variety of emotions, doubts, anxieties, and yet in the end, it turns out to be what is best for not only us, but the world around us. So last week in the Sirah class, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ was before, during, uh, and after the revelation and at the beginning of Islam. So not just from 
the uh, he was not just like, you know, someone who was a status uh, of like a high person. He was just a regular person, but he was someone who's trustworthy. And he, he, he was someone who's just an ordinary person, but then he became a prophet. He was then made up into a prophet. But we, we dove beyond these black and white uh, labels into something more personal and intimate. So prior to prophethood, we talked about how the Prophet Sun was a fairly shy, reticent, reserved person who wasn't emanating this self-confidence or bravado uh, or walked with his chest up or anything like that. He was just kept to himself. Even when he was married, had a family, he was someone who kept to himself, was a private person, um, such to the degree that you'll see that after the, uh, the message that he proclaims, the message that he proclaims to his kinfolk, they are wondering that why an ordinary person like him would be made God's representatives and not one of the more eloquent in their tribe or one of the or more eloquent in the city of Mecca, like Walid ibn Mughira, that why, why not someone who's actually, you know, at the forefront of things. Um, Khadija, we talked about in the Sirah class that had at, uh, at the marriage proposal to the Prophet Sallallahu had said that, you know, you're not someone who is at the center of everything. You're, you're someone who stays at the sides uh, and you're not someone who's basically seeking attention or wanting to put yourself out there. And this kind of gives us an insight into what the Prophet Sallallahu was like before prophethood, that he wasn't someone that would aggrandize himself or whatnot. He would just kind of stay at the periphery and he would be satisfied with not being in the spotlight. And for lack of better words, he was just a regular guy. His reaction to the revelation itself and the revelatory event uh, on uh, Jabal Nur or the cave of Hira reflects this. It wasn't something that he welcomed or was long awaited or anything like that. The prophet wasn't sitting um, at the cave of Hira telling Jibreel, hey, you're late, man. Um, when the message came, he wasn't sitting there waiting. Uh, it came completely unexpected. It was distressing. It was traumatizing. It was scary. His his breath was short. He was, he was basically uh, being constricted in all the different forms. And so you think about that, that it wasn't a, a very glorified type of uh, romanticized event that we sometimes have in our relations today, but we think about it, it was something that he was not expecting. He was just going for his own spiritual retreat, his own time, and this happened. This was very distressing. And the first reaction of him, apart from the instance of uh, having to read or recite the first reaction reflected this. He ran down the mountain and uh, ran down the mountain to tell his wife to cover him, that he was crying, he was fearing that he was a madman, he was losing it, that he was, might be bewitched or cursed. And even in some traditions, contemplating that maybe like he needs to just uh, end his self-perceived misery in light of such doubt that he doesn't know what's going on, maybe I ought to just end it all. So all these different doubts and all these different things are kind of going through. So you can tell that this wasn't just a, oh, aha moment. This was a moment that was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm losing it and I'm going to just completely just cut it short. But in short, this revelation was not something that was not only unexpected, but how it came in might have really felt unwanted. And it was dealt with as such. The signs that are showing are not something that are uh, seen by someone who's like, yeah, I'll take it. I'll, I'll gladly take what you've got. It was something of, no, this is like, that, that. I don't know what's happening, but hey, this isn't me. You've got the wrong person. Um, and we're sometimes made to think as a result um, from romanticizing these events and just thinking in very simple terms that trust in Allah, that tawakkul is something that doesn't come with qualities that are human, as in self-doubt reproach, fear. We oftentimes romanticize these and think these that, uh, oh, this is uh, things that are given and people of God are the ones that will take it in stride and not doubt anything or not have any kind of inner tension or um, self-doubt about themselves, anything like that. Um, but we, we actually see this in the prophetic examples that this is actually case in point what happens when, um, when in the prophetic example or in the intervention of God within our own lives takes place, it's unsettling because it is, it's, it's disrupting what we find to be normative. It's unsettling because it calls us to be a higher being. It causes us to be a higher self. Um, and that, that's not always an easy transition. And so this isn't exclusive to the Prophet ﷺ. We recall how Musa salam, his reaction when he was appointed by Allah and charged to go to uh, Pharaoh and to speak the truth and to liberate his people was said that take Aaron, take my brother instead, take him instead because you know M Musa had like a lisp, he had a speech impediment, um, and you know he, he he perceived himself to just be a lowly shepherd. Um, he had a lack of self confidence in that area. Or you think about Maryam alayhi salam, 
that being given the news of Isa and just being like, what? No, like, you know, what is this? Like, I, that, that's not me. You got the wrong person. Like, who are you? Uh, so just these, the, it wasn't just these things that we sometimes take in and in a sense of children's stories that, yeah, they took it and they ran with stride. They struggled with it. They just imagine what it would be like to be given something that is completely unwanted, but something that would change your life and having to work with that. But on top of that, it's God telling you that this is what you're going to get, but still being able to have those feelings. So for us in, in, in our time here, where we don't have the revelatory moments that uh, the Prophet ﷺ had with Jibreel on Hira, um, we may have a little bit more disconnect here, how does it tell us that if these people who were companions in a sense or given uh, a direct communication from God had this reaction, what can we expect of ourselves when we react? Is it out of the unusual if we you know, just start to doubt ourselves or have these emotions, um, it's it's completely natural. And so we want to normalize that, but we want to take it into stride here. Um, and then we, and as we had opened up a little bit with Harry Potter, it's only naturally that we relate back at times, but in relating back to Harry Potter, we see this as well. He had no idea that he was a wizard, that his family were wizard, that uh, he had no idea what magic was, or even if he was the right person to be uh, selected for this, that he, he just was just an ordinary kid. Like why he just had a scar on his head. Like that was it. But like, what, what, what made him distinguished? He had a lot of self-doubt. He had a lot of low confidence in himself because of what he was growing up around. But he found himself thrusted into a situation that necessitated growth and which brought out his true self. So C.C. Cheng had, uh, had quoted this with respect that the greater the doubt within a person, the greater the doubt, the greater the awakening is. Uh, and we'll see this with the Prophet Sallallahu especially as uh, this person who's in doubt at the beginning of revelation and continues to experience this doubt for the first couple of years is someone by the fourth year who emanates this kind of confidence and the confidence in their faith. And we'll come to that in a second. But how does this all relate to us? The Quran tells us that perhaps we might love a thing or perhaps we might hate a thing and it's good for us. And perhaps we might love a thing and it's bad for us. But uh, Allah knows and we do not. So when we think that what we might plan out, what we'll think will be 10 years from now, five years from now, what our careers would be, what all of our trajectories are, we need to know that these can all change regardless of our age or regardless of where we might be. We might be completely secure, 40 years old, settled down and not think that anything's gonna happen. Or we might just be 22 out of college and uh, just thinking that, hey, I'm set on this way. I've, uh, I went through college, I'm on this career, I'm gonna stay this way and things might change. The Prophet Sallallahu was 40 years old. Harry Potter was 11. Uh, go, you, we want to go through life as we can, but we want to be open to change. And the other thing is we always float this idea that, hey, change is good. Change is always uh, something that's good. Change might be good, but change doesn't always feel good. Change can feel corrosive. It can feel upsetting. Even uh, a precious metal finds its true value going through a furnace, being removed of those impurities and coming out for its true values. But it goes through the heat of a moment to, to become its true values. You can, it, this change can also feel unwanted. We might be comfortable. We don't, we don't need change. We're, we're okay where we're at, but we can always try and resist, but destiny will always catch up to us. We might try our best to take things here in an open heart. And we want to try and take things with an open heart, an open mind, patience and trust and trust that that which will happen will be for the best. But the Prophet Sallallahu example and even Harry Potter show us that all of these things don't just have to be things that we take on solely. We don't have to just be people who are complete vessels that just have open hearts, open minds, patience, and trust. These are high values. And for anybody to have even one of these is, is admirable. But to have all of those and just say, hey, just uh, trust in the law and be all of these things. It's difficult to be all those things because it's hard to be one of them. And so the Prophet ﷺ had Khadija, who he went to reassure him. To, co to console him, to counsel him, to hold him when he felt uncertain of who he was or what he had to do. And later on, he then had a circle of close supporters who were there for him. Harry Potter had Hagrid, the groundskeeper for Hogwarts, who was a, a more wise 
presence, and as well as his close friends, Hermione and Ron, who supported him even when it was in times of danger, but also in times of doubt, when he doubted himself. This journey of life might be one that we experience individually, that we just personally experience individually, but it's not meant or limited to be just about us or just for us. We are called by Islam uh, to, above all, beyond our faith, to remain resilient. As Muslims and as people of faith, we believe that this journey is one that starts with Allah, and it's one that returns to Allah. We've often talked about this in the previous khutbah, uh, khutbahs with regards to uh, this journey of life, being a return to Allah and a return from Allah. And so sometimes our GPS will take us through routes and paths that aren't what we're used to, but it may be that it's not only the fastest route to the destination, but it might be one that avoids various hazards and accidents. But even along the way, we're given different signs to follow, to make sure that we get to the right place. And as people who subscribe to a higher faith, as people who subscribe to a higher being, we believe that these ayatullah, these signs of Allah, are not just those which have manifested as a result of a pen touching a paper and being enclosed in a book, but everything around us, especially the people who we share life with, are signs. The Quran talks especially about this, telling us how the creation of the heavens and the earth, the environment, the days, the time, the changing of the night and the day, these are all signs. These are all signs for us, both in the days which are brightest and in the nights which are darkest. It is important that as we go through life, we keep ourselves aware of the temporality of our situation and the circumstances. Things might not go according to plan because as we know in the Quran, Allah says that Allah is the best of planners and disposer of affairs. And this trust we build relies on that. But that doesn't mean that we can't experience things like doubt, that we can't experience scary feelings. That's natural, but we, we, it's grounded in this aspect that there's trust that's there. When we do hit a snag, when we do hit a difficult portion or we're given a seemingly unwanted uh, responsibility or burden that we first and foremost, it's important we stay honest with ourselves, however it looks like. It may be that you need to cry when you need to. The Prophet ﷺ cried after receiving his revelation and cried running down the mountain. It might be that you seek out a counselor, a therapist, or a confidant to be able to process your feelings with, like the Prophet ﷺ did with Khadija. Or it might be that you remain humble and you don't give into arrogance, that no matter how much people build you up and build up your ego, that you still stay humble, like Harry Potter did. And recognizing that change takes a process. And as I mentioned, it took four years for the Prophet Prophet ﷺ, after receiving his first revelation that he was instructed and able to give his message publicly. It took four years to build confidence of this person to be able to just proclaim things publicly. So don't be bogged down by the detractors in your life like the Vernon Dursleys and the Abu Lahabs or by our own notion of not having enough time or doubting yourself, but maintain trust. Maintain trust and that whatever it is that you're being tasked with, it is not something that you'll be experiencing in absolute isolation. For as the Quran says that when my servant asks about me, and Allah saying that, tell them that I am near and th that Allah is with us. So regardless of where we may be, we always need something to keep us grounded. And for us, it is that same faith, same trust that not only the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had, but that our mother Hajar, the wife of Ibrahim had when she was in the barren desert uh, with her infant child and holding her son left by her husband, where she said powerfully that Allah will not forsake us despite having nothing to look forward to um, and being in a strange land. So we'll continue in the next part of the khutbah as we, uh, as we dwell on this concept of resilience as a part of faith. I say these words of mine and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of humanity, and I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, so in conclusion, we have a tradition across our faiths, whether we're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, any, Hindu, any of our faiths here, we have a tradition uh, that is of resilience. And especially in Islam, we have a tradition of resilience of men and women whose examples not only show their resilience, but their humanity and their struggle in taking on an unexpected and unwanted burden. We saw how the Prophet ﷺ literally ran away 
and sought refuge with his wife, seeking shelter and doubting himself away from what God had called him to do. We read of how Maryam السلام, even after being told what her destiny was and what she was going to expect with the birth of a, of a son who was a word from Allah, still during the pangs of that birth had forsaken her own ex existence and her own birth. We see Musa السلام, not being confident in his own ability and doubting himself hoping that someone better and someone more eloquent would be given his, his, uh, his, the chance. And in the, uh, in the gospel, we see Isa salam, distressed concerning the persecution that is about to come and he, how he asks for the chalice, how he asks for the chalice or the burden that is put upon him to be passed to somebody else. And in Hajar, we see that despite the unexpected and unwanted circumstance, the power that holding faith has in a completely desert environment and how the power of trusting Allah comes into play when you literally have nothing. Yet, she still in the tradition sat down and cried when she just gave up. She became desperate. She tried her best, but she started crying and she became desperate. And at that point, uh, Allah intervened. But you see that the, the variety of emotions that people are facing, that life's challenges, whether through our careers, whether through our attachment to our lifestyles, our relationships, our marriages, our children, wealth, all these things will be sources of joy, but also sources of a test and trial for us. The Quran tells us that these are things that are meant to test us, not just because Allah is a deity who enjoys simply toying with the creation, but in their lives and in our ways here provides avenues for these people and for us to become our best selves, whether through adversity or through prosperity. So take what life has given you. Take what life has given you and don't be afraid to react in a way that might feel unbecoming or uncompromising or compromising. Listen to your heart, be honest to your emotions and be authentic. Yet avail yourself to that which is around you. There's a reason that, that, that there are all these signs, these ayah that are around you and become the best person you can be. You don't have to literally be the best at the tangible or practical things in life, but you can aspire to become the best person. At the end of the first book of Harry Potter, uh, Harry Potter tells Hermione Granger that he's not as good of a wizard as she is, you know, to which she responds that there's more important things to wizardry than just books and cleverness, but friendship, bravery, care, compassion, love. There's more to life than just the ornaments and the embellishments which we feel that we may create or be given. There are the values. And for us today, one of those defining values is resilience and authenticity. So in good times and in bad, we take this gem that was shared by the Prophet Sallam, who said, while holding his infant son who had just passed away and while crying over the son, he had said that the eyes weep, the heart grieves, but we will say only that which pleases our Lord. For verily with hardship does come peace. وَآخِرُ وَدَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ إِبَادَ اللَّهِ رَحِمَكُمُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْمُرُ بِالْأَدْلِ وَالْإِيسَانِ وَإِتَاعِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْحَى عَنِ الْفَعْشَى وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي يَعِيذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ فَذَكْرُونَ أذكروا الله يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر. O servants of Allah, may Allah be merciful to you. Verily, Allah commands you to act with justice, to confer benefits upon one another, and to do good to others as one does to one's kindred, and forbid evil which pertains to yourselves and the evils which affect other people. And he prohibits unlawful rebellion. He warns you against being unmindful. You remember Allah and Allah too will remember you. Call upon Allah and Allah will make a response to your call. And verily divine remembrance is the highest virtue. In closing, we ask Allah to grant us this uh, this amana, this trust of this Juma to, to take on this responsibility as uh, Muslims as believers to be uh, better than we came, than we came into this Jummah, to be resilient regardless of what we face, but to be with us in our trials and tribulations. Uh, we ask Allah to uh, bestow justice, to bestow restitution and restoration and comfort upon all those who are oppressed and to allow us to be enablers of this justice, to be enablers of the restitution, the restoration and the comfort. We ask Allah to make us voices for those who are voiceless, the outside 
outspoken for the silence, the liberators for the oppressed and the nourishers of the hungry, the shelterers of the homeless and the refugee and the advocates who are persecuted. And we ask Allah to remind us each and every day that it is okay to stumble, but uh, that Allah is always there to help us pick back up. So, Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka antas samiul alim. O our Lord, accept this service from us, for Thou art hearing and the All Knowing. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I believe there is just a uh, quick announcement um, that that is here. At least I can just share uh, that we have a Sira class that is happening tonight. So our uh, Prophet and I Sira series will continue tonight, inshallah, at 6 p.m. Uh, we will be. Uh, continuing that. And so if you found this khutbah to be a benefit, uh, this is deriving from the Sira uh, series that we're doing. So please come by. We do a uh, about a 60 minute uh, lecture and then we go into a 30 minute discussion open to the group. So we would hope to see you all there. Um, and then uh, Shadi, is there any other announcements that we would like to make or anything else that we, we, we can announce here? Maybe just that we have the shoe drive and the morning work day at Church of the Savior on July 17th. It's Saturday morning from eight to about noon. And we know it's hot, but it'd be a great way to um, stop by, pitch in, just, you know, kind of um, show a little love to the uh, the church grounds where we hold uh, our aid services. And of course the building is where we do our Friday prayers and inshallah we'll, we will return soon. And there's also a shoe drive. So Church of the Savior is partnered with a local nonprofit um, and working to uh, get uh, new shoes for, um, uh, children uh, ages like kindergarten to 12th grade. So any size shoes, preferably name, name brand and definitely new would be greatly appreciated. You can just drop them at the church that morning. All right, good deal, good deal. Well, that's, that's all I've got here. Any, any, if anything else, um, how's everybody doing? <laughs>